it comes off fine. They pull it, if you rip it off, you can rip your map up. Ma'am, I'm going to hand you something. You're the star. Are oh, you going to join me? <laughs> <laughs> this is a... <laughs> you can that way yet. It's been my day so far. Okay, you're free to go. Okay. <laughs> free to go. So, um, good afternoon. Welcome. I am Ron Brevik, your speaker, for this presentation of Ride in the Big Sky, One Mile at a Time. At the end of this presentation, I look forward to answering questions that you may have. So, without any further ado, let's go for a ride. Is, can everyone hear me? Yeah. And it, you can, sir. You're good. Okay. Just. Heads off, too. <laughs> There's always one guy in the crowd. <laughs> I made sure it was off, so I did get pointed out. Well, you keep me on 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 task, okay? Okay. All right. Just imagine yourself for a moment. It's early morning. The sun is just coming up, and you're sipping a fresh cup of coffee. You pull on your boots, slip up your chaps, and tie your scarf. Walking out to greet the day, you throw your leg over and settle into the saddle. Reins in hand, ready for another day's ride. It's a good morning already, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we gotta do this today. Maybe. This is my story of riding the big sky one mile at a time. What started out as a day's ride in 2003 turned into the adventure of a lifetime. 16 years and 70,000 miles later, I had discovered Montana. So I invite you to saddle up and ride along with me as we explore some of the remarkable people and places that I have documented. I have been riding motorcycles for over 50 years, and in 2003, I purchased this 100-year anniversary Harley-Davidson Heritage Softail Springer. My rides were an escape into adventure, a full sensory experience. Not only did I see it, I felt it, smelled it, and tasted it. From sunrise to sunset, glistening morning dew to cool evening breezes, I rode alone as evidence of my license plate, L-U-Z-N space U, losing you. <laughs> like cowboys of the past and present, we all saddle up with leather and scarf. The only difference being, my horse was a chrome and steel, a modern day cowboy. With a true sense of seeking adventure, I rode the vistas of the wide open plains to the high mountain peaks. I chased the beaver slide haying operations from the Avon Valley to the Big Hole. People always ask me, are you writing a book? Keeping a journal? I replied, no. They take photographs, as many as I can. Like those before me, I wanted to capture and preserve the sun-weathered cowboy and the old faded barns. The stories, the stories abound. The very fabric of who we are, where we have come from, and the hardships endured carving out this last frontier. As for leather and scarf, here are my leather chaps, crafted by Valley Boot and Saddle of Kalispell. I made the conchos from Mexican five peso coins. It's always good to have a little extra money on the road, isn't it? <laughs> the scarf serves a good deterrent for both dust and bugs. As an angry yellow jacket down the shirt at 70 miles an hour, is no fun. The ride started as a curiosity, the simple desire to explore. It soon turned into the goal to ride every mile of paved road in the state of Montana. After each ride, I would mark off in black on this map the roads that I had ridden, and I placed a push pin into where I had rested for the night. As I rode, I found the need to connect with the people that I met along the way more than just passing by. So, I created a postcard. The photo came from a Whitefish Credit Union advertisement featuring photos of boys and their toys. 
On the front of the postcard, I wrote, Montana's greatest traders, be found on the back roads. And on the back, I wrote a short introduction. These postcards became my calling card. I would pre-stamp them ahead of my rides, and I handed them out all across the state. This presentation has been paraded from a collection of those postcards. So as I speak, I will read a few of those traded stories. We will ride from the northern border of Montana to the southern Big Hole Valley. And along the way, we will visit many of the smaller towns and communities. I will introduce you to the people of Montana, from a real showgirl in Ovando to a smelly sheep rancher in Dillon. And I will tell you about some of the things that I saw along the way that makes Montana, Montana. From steak dinners to a storm that nearly killed me. As we explore the Big Sky State, please refer to the map that I've handed out. It will help you follow along on our journey. We start by riding south from Kalispell to the beautiful Swan Valley. Our first stop is at the Swan Valley Community Hall near Condon, built in 1939. Throughout Montana, whether it be a church, community center, or Grange Hall, good people come together and weave the very fabric of life as we know it. This postcard came to me from the ladies of the Condon's Sip and Sew group. You just have to love that one, don't you? Your postcard reads, we're the ladies of the Condon Sip and Sew group. We found your card in the door of our community center. We'll drink a toast to your road trip and wish you well. Our community has lots of fun little groups like ours. Happy trails. Can you envision these local Swan Valley ladies sitting around together, sipping and sewing? One can only imagine the stories they must share. Cheers. Continuing south to City Lake, which is the home to Gus, the world's oldest western larch tree. Here's an interesting fact. The western larch is the only deciduous slash conifer tree in the world, meaning that it drops its needles annually. Perhaps you have seen the mountains all ablaze with their golden yellow needles in the fall. It's just beautiful. Gus is estimated to be at least 1,000 years old. Just think of this. Gus was a 500-year-old tree before Columbus set sail for the New World. That's a long time to be standing around, isn't it? Oh, I tell you. Heading east from the Swan Valley, we come to Ovando on Montana Highway 200 at the southern end of the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Ovando is home to Trixie's Antler Saloon, made famous by a show stop on horse riding calf rope and cowgirl named Trixie McCormick. <laughs> Trixie, whose real name was Ethel Stokes, <laughs> performed in the Wild West shows in the 40s and 50s. In 1960, at the end of her touring days, Trixie settled down in Ovando and opened up this roadside saloon. If you ever find yourself passing by, stop in and check out a real Montana cowboy bar. And if you're hungry, order yourself a Trixie burger and enjoy. Here's Trixie in her performing days, along with her show dog, Cutie. Her show costumes raised more than a few eyebrows in the 40s and 50s. <laughs> they did. Yeah. Riding southeast from Ovando, we come to Helmville in Powell <coughs> County. Helmville was named for Henry Helm, the original postmaster in 1872. An interesting fact, all of the Montana Town Pump gas stations got their name from Helmville. Originally, the town pump was simply the town water pump. This postcard claims the name came from the local gas station. But before they had a gas pump, 
They had the town water pumped. And for all you rodeo fans, Helmville boasts of having the biggest little rodeo in the state of Montana every September on Labor Day weekend. And after the rodeo, they have a good old Montana hoedown. So grab your gal, get out there, and have fun. Here is the official Montana State animal, the mighty grizzly bear. This bear was a healthy 12-year-old male weighing 830 pounds and standing 8 feet tall when, in 2007, he was hit and killed by a vehicle on Montana Highway 200 near Lincoln. The story goes that this bear had developed a taste for the treats that humans unintentionally provided. Consequently, he had been shot by a shotgun blinding him in his left eye. One day, when crossing the highway, he looked both ways, but unfortunately, due to his impairment, he did not make it. Here you go, you can take over for me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he is on display at the Lincoln Ranger District Office. Stop in and marvel at his size. Don't touch, but put your hand next to one of his paws and be amazed. Just look at the size of those claws. Can you say ouch? I say ouch. <laughs> Montana is a state of many diverse wildlife species. As this postcard reads, one of the few places wildlife are as common a sight in town as people. From a grizzly and her cubs at the river campground, to a bobcat at the golf course, to deer in town. Just think of this. It is estimated that there are between 1,800 and 2,000 grizzly bears roaming around out there in the Montana backcountry. So I suggest you watch your back. Here is another interesting story from Lincoln. This one peculiar fellow used to spend hours in this Lincoln, Montana phone booth, according to the locals. One could only imagine the topics of his long conversations. His name, Ted Kaczynski, <laughs> better known as the Unabomber. Ted recently passed away at the age of 81 while serving a life sentence at the Federal Medical Center in Butner, North Carolina. An interesting fact about Ted, Ted's IQ, 167, genius. Not that I condone his behavior. <laughs> Heading south down the Avon Valley, one of the most beautiful and unspoiled cattle ranching valleys in Montana. Jack, pictured here, is a lifelong Avon Valley rancher. Now retired, but by no means resting. He is a world-class, officially sanctioned, Horseshoe pitching official. He has private indoor pitching pits in his garage slash shop on his property. Very friendly fellow, Korean War veteran. I met him while I was photographing in the Avon area. He invited me in to see his horseshoe pitching pits. Very serious about them. His good friend and pitching partner, Archie, per his last request, was cremated and placed in the horseshoe pit pictured here. <laughs> ashes to ashes and dust to dust, that's love. As for dawn to dusk, there's Jim, the caretaker for the Avon Cemetery. 
It is a beautiful and well-maintained cemetery with incredible mountain views. I would be proud to rest there. Jim knew the history of all those who were at rest there and had many stories to tell. Like many people from small, rural Montana towns, Jim was born in Avon and has never wanted to leave. I am sure that will be his final wish. <laughs> now you got me laughing. <laughs> Riding further south, you will find Jackson, an unincorporated community in the Big Hole Valley. Jackson lost their post office to a disastrous fire. So they had to improvise. Here is a concession stand, along with a port john attached to it with bungee cords posting the U.S. mail. Montanans will roll up their sleeves and do whatever it takes to get the job done. The Jackson Post Office, OIC, officer in charge, is a woman named Delilah. I have stopped and enjoyed conversation with her several times as I rode through the valley. Her postcard reads, I met you going through Jackson, Montana. I am OIC at the post office concession stand. <laughs> Our town is known for hot springs and hardworking people, land of 10,000 haystacks. We are proud of our valley and the people we meet going through town. Safe journey to you. Thank you for stopping and telling me about your travels, Delilah. After a couple of years in the improvised concession stand, the Jackson Post Office has finally found a home in the Bunkhouse Hotel, room number one. Jackson's population is 30 hearty souls and a few old dogs. Here's Delilah, one of those wonderful hearty souls enjoying her morning coffee. Check out the postcard she's holding. Does it look familiar? You bet it does. In the big old valley, you will find the beaver slides which have been used for haying operations between Jackson and Wisdom for well over 100 years. The valley is better known as the Valley of 10,000 Haystacks. Originally, the work of cutting and stacking the hay was performed by men and teams of horses. Hay would be pushed onto the bottom slide, and then a team of horses would pull the slide of hay up onto the stack. Beaver slides are still being used in the valley, although modern machinery has all but replaced them. Truly a piece of history. I was fortunate to have been able to photograph and see them in action before they completely disappear. Note the mountain range in the background. That is the continental divide between Montana and Idaho. Here is another photo of a beaver slide in action as the haystack nears completion. Note the modern tractor with the side hay rake and the odd looking buck rakes in the foreground. This is a close up of the buck rake. It is an old stripped down vehicle that is driven in reverse for better traction. It is used to gather the cut hay and push onto the slides. It looked to be a wild ride as I watched several of them working together in the field. Can you say yee-haw? Anybody? Yee-haw! <laughs> <laughs> Heading east to Polaris, an unincorporated community in between Jackson and Dillon in the Grasshopper Valley. It is home to the Polar Bar, a post office, and a few other old buildings. The Polar Bar was closed by the state of Montana in the early 1990s because it did not have indoor plumbing. Like, that's a reason not to drink. <laughs> in its day, the door was unlocked and open to everyone. Just leave your money in the old coffee can on the bar top and help yourself. Can you imagine the locals whooping it up on a Friday night out in the middle of nowhere? 
I had heard that Saturday night poker game could go on for days. Postcard reads, Ron, what a beautiful day to ride. It is the first day it's been smoke free for three months. Touring the back roads of Montana must be fun and the memories very rewarding. Happy riding. It was a Friday night, Dillon, Montana, at the Klondike. I was sitting at the bar having a burger and a beer. Went in and watched this smelly old sheep rancher who sits down beside me and orders a drink. So naturally, we start talking. He tells me he's running eight bands of sheep at the time, and that he was taking in a night on the town and already had been drinking a little bit. <laughs> As it is in these small towns, everyone knows everyone. So in walks this dainty little prim and proper lady, pinkish blue hair, little handbag, sits down at the bar and orders a fruity looking drink with a little umbrella in it. As she's sitting there sipping her drink and listening to the two of us carrying on, she turns to the rancher and says, Donnie, you smell like shit. <laughs> he whips around, looks at her, his eyes all a glare, and says, Honey, that's the smell of money. <laughs> we chuckled, smiled at each other, and ordered another drink. A band of sheep can be 12 to 1,500, depending upon the ewes and their yet unborn lambs, which are also counted. So, eight bands is roughly 10,000 sheep. That's a lot of money, honey. How's this for Montana? The worst storm that I've ever been through was just outside of Twin Bridges. I rode out of Big Fork on the way to Ennis in the Yellowstone area, August 1st, 2013. As I headed down the Swan Valley, my bike started having engine problems, misfiring. I thought it could be a loose ignition switch wire. The Victory Motorcycle Shop in Sealy Lake declined to let me use their tools to check it out. I knew that there was a Harley Davidson dealership in Butte, and I thought that I could make it there. On the interstate, between Garrison and Butte, the bike really started missing. But I made it. The Butte dealership did not have the switch that I needed and told me it would take two weeks to get one. So, I jammed the switch open with a small wooden stick and held it in place with some Gorilla Tape until I could get it fixed. I ended up running 2,000 miles on that trip with a bad ignition switch. On the way to Ennis, the storm really started hitting. The sky was black, the wind was crazy, and the lightning was spectacular. I made it to Twin Bridges, but I could not go much further. So I pulled over and hid under a big lilac bush near a farmhouse. Hail, wind, rain, just the worst. A break in the storm hit, so I hightailed it to Ennis. When I got to the hotel in Ennis, the man behind the front desk asked me where I had ridden in from. I told him Twin Bridges. He did not believe me, not until I showed him this photograph of the storm that I had taken. Then he filled me in on the details. 104 mile an hour winds all the way up to Haver. Roads full of debris, crops destroyed. It was on the front page of the newspaper the next morning. The Montana Standard front page article, Storm Pummels Twin Bridges. Have you ever heard of being forewarned? Well, I had four warnings that day. Number one, I had engine problems. Number two, the Victory Motorcycle Shop declined to let me use their tools. Number three, the Butte Harley Davidson dealership could not help me out. Number four, the spectacular lightning. 
Did I heed the warnings? I was fortunate to have safely ridden through that storm unharmed. Let's meet Sam. She attended bar in Norris and lived in Pony. Pony is a fascinating gold mining town just west of Harrison on Route 283. Many of the homes and buildings are beautifully constructed from brick, as the gold mine was very prosperous there in its day. If you ever find time, go to Pony and check it out. Have you ever heard of a bikini hatch? Not a fly hatch for you fly fishermen, but a bikini hatch. As the summer sun warms, the bikini hatch becomes a very colorful sight and pony, as Sam will attest to. As well, the bikini hatch really comes to life on the Madison River near Norris, as it is inundated with rafts full of bikinis all summer long. <laughs> and for you fly fishermen, it's catch and release only. <laughs> Here is one of the more colorful postcards that I've ever received. Norris is at the intersection of routes 287 and 84. After taking a plunge in the Norris Hot Springs, enjoy a great burger and beer at the Snoring Horse Bar and Grill. It's the best burger in town, as this postcard claims. Well, truth be told, it's the only burger in town. <laughs> Heading north, up to Harrison on Route 287, you'll find the Harrison Post Office, which is very close to the Montana's oldest state park, the Lewis and Clark Caverns, which were established in 1935. In Harrison, the story goes that in 1930, the local bank was robbed by two fellows from Butte. In pursuit of the two, the sheriff was mistaken for a robber and shot and killed. They closed the bank, and the building remained empty until 1936. It has been home to the Harrison Post Office ever since. Now to one of my favorite resting places while on the road. Sacagawea Hotel in Three Forks. Three Forks is close to where the Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin Rivers come together to form the headwaters of the mighty Missouri River, hence the name Three Forks. Originally, the Madison House, which was built in 1862, was moved from a mile away to its present location and transformed into the Sacagawea Hotel in 1910. The Sacagawea is a beautiful hotel, a wonderful place to relax on the veranda after a long day's ride, have a cocktail, and watch the sun go down. Excuse me, I'll take a drink. <laughs> nice shirt. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Blue bandana. <laughs> Beautiful day, right? Beautiful day. <clears throat> right in the east from Three Forks, we come to the Pine Butte Schoolhouse, a one room schoolhouse built in 1895, just west of Bozeman on Route 84, better known as the Norris Road. Can you imagine how many children attended classes there? before its closing in 1955. The postcard reads, thank you for stopping at the Pine Butte School on Norris Road. I wish I could have given you a tour. Come back sometime to meet the alumni. <laughs> a tour at a one-room schoolhouse? That makes me smile. <laughs> Heading northeast up from Bozeman to Lenham, which is between Ringling and Martinsdale on Route 294. The Lenape Lutheran Church, which was built in 1910, 
is now the oldest evangelical Lutheran church in the state of Montana. Six generations of congregants. On this blue sky day, I found the church doors unlocked, nobody around, and the offering jar nearly full of dollar bills. That's trust in God. All five cattle ranches in the valley are still owned by the original Norwegian families who settled in the area. This postcard is indicative of their life and hard work in Lena. So, eat beef, it's what's for dinner. <laughs> yes, it's a real place. Just to the east of Lena, on Route 12, is the world famous town of Tudot, Montana. Tudot got its name from the cattle brand of Two Dots, side by side from George R. Wilson, 1830 to 1907, a.k.a. 2. Wilson. If you ever find yourself passing by, stop into the 2. Dot bar for some very interesting roadside history conversation. As well, they serve a really great lunch. Really, <laughs> they do. To the south, we come to Big Timber, the county seat to Sweetgrass County. Big Timber was named by William Clark of the 1804-1806 Lewis and Clark Expedition because of the large cottonwood trees along the banks of the Yellowstone River. At one time, Big Timber shipped more than 5 million pounds of sheep wool by rail in a single year. To put that into perspective, one sheep can produce two to 30 pounds of wool in a year. So, let's do the math. Ah, that's a lot of sheep. <laughs> One pound of wool can produce a single strand of yarn up to 10 miles long. The wool is highly valued for clothing the American soldiers during both of the two world wars. Just another way that Montana was part of the world stage. Postcard reads, in the early part of the 1900s, Big Timber shipped more wool from their rail shop than anywhere else in the world. The local high school team mascot is the Sheeper. The Grand Hotel in downtown Big Timber was built in 1890, over 130 years ago. Stop in and enjoy a Montana steak dinner in a truly classic Montana restaurant bar. You will not be disappointed. And while you're dining, or just having a beverage, check out the wildlife head mounts. They are truly amazing. The moose is H-U-G-E, huge. He's huge. Did I say he's huge? God, he's huge. Just to the east is Reed Point in Stillwater County. It is home to the annual Great Montana Sheep Drive, where the sheep are driven straight down Main Street through town for all three blocks. <laughs> Reed Point's population is 171. The annual drive has been attended by thousands. It's a good time for all, although there has been no comment from the sheep. <laughs> the annual drive date can change, so be sure to check the dates before you go. Hammond is yet another unincorporated ranching community. Just imagine nearly as southeast in the state of Montana that you can possibly go, and there's Hammond. For many years, it has consisted of only a rancher's home and the post office. The overgrown sign reads video rentals most likely VHS tapes back in the day. Here's a postcard from the Hammond Postmaster whose car broke down and was given a car to use by a stranger, a complete stranger. That's Montana friendly. The irony? I went to the post office to mail a postcard and was told the postage was short by one penny. And yes, that's her name. Did she offer me one penny? No, she did not. 
So I went back out to my bike to root around until I finally found some change for my single one cent stamp. Penny paid up as well. Note the one cent stamp on the postcard she sent to me. <laughs> Dear Penny. Heading north to Terry, 562 individuals strong, the county seat to Prairie County. It is home to the Evelyn Cameron Gallery. Evelyn moved to Montana from England in 1891, along with her husband, to raise polo ponies. Her husband passed away, but she stayed on and began photographing the early prairie life. Her photographs were found much later after her death. Evelyn is renowned for her preservation of Montana's early history through her photography. She is praised for her passion, curiosity, and awareness of everyday life, something that I too am very well aware of. A visit to the Evelyn Cameron Gallery is well worth your time. Northwest from Terry is yet another unincorporated community. Seems to be a lot of them in Montana. I will get to that fact shortly. Cohagen is home to about four buildings, one of which is the Cohagen Bar, pictured here. It appears that squirt may be a popular drink in Cohagen. When was the last time you enjoyed a cold bottle of squirt? Last week. Cohagen was briefly known nationally thanks to the 1886 William Hornaday expedition. William was a taxidermist by profession. He brought a live bison bull and calf back to Washington, D.C. The bison were preserved and displayed at the, at the Smithsonian Institution until 1958. The bison were then shipped back to Montana and are now on display at the Montana Agricultural Center and Museum in Fort Benton. William Hornaday is credited with helping save the American bison. And as recently as 2016, <coughs> The American bison was named one of our national symbols. On a side note, bison are commonly referred to as buffalo. True buffalo, such as the water or cape buffalo, are native to Asia and Africa, respectively. Bison can only be found in North America and Europe. Riding northeast, we come to Antelope in Sheridan County. Antelope's population is 51. It is designated as a CDP, defined as a census designated place, which are typically unincorporated communities. As of 2018, there were 235 CDPs in the state of Montana. In Antelope, you will find a well-preserved historic concrete jail. One can only imagine what one could have done to earn a night in the Antelope jail. Oh, not really. <laughs> Some people tend to misbehave. Note the highway sign, Antelope, next seven exits. <laughs> One exit for each of their seven graveled side streets. <laughs> and they all go to the east. Here's a story about my Montana roots. My mother's family settled in Plentywood, and my father's family in Zoll, North Dakota, just east of the Montana state line. My mother and father met, fell in love, and the rest, as they say, is history. As a child, I had always been told that my mother's father was buried up on that windy hill just outside of Plentywood 
never really knowing what that meant. So, I rode back with the goal to find my grandfather's gravesite. I rode into town, headed to the courthouse in the center of town. I was sitting there on my bike, wondering where to start my search, when an ATV pulled up alongside of me and screeched to a stop. The friendly rider asked me, what are you doing? I told him that I am looking for the cemetery. At that, he said, without missing a beat, oh, it's up on that windy hill. <laughs> he then asked me, who are you? I told him that I am a Brevik. Oh, he said, I'm married to a Brevik from North Dakota. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's a small world sometimes. Unbelievable. And yes, I found my grandfather's gravesite up on that windy hill. Was it windy? <laughs> it was windy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's another story. Right in the west, very near the Canadian border, are two neighboring communities separated by 48 miles of prairie grassland. Loring in Phillips County, population 14. And Turner in Blaine County, population 61. Loring was once a bustling town. Now only 14 people live in town. Two of them waved to me as I rode through. <laughs> Sadly, they lost much of their town to a fire in the 60s, as the postcard reads. Great project. I am also a Montana native and have lived in the same area for 69 years. Three businesses burned to the ground back in the 60s. The lumber yard, hmm, suspicious, post office and store. We still have the others. We, we still have a post office, but not the others. We lost a hotel and a restaurant around the same time. There are 14 people who live in town. Can you imagine Sunday morning services in that church on the right hand side? Wow. Turner is 12 miles south of the Canadian border. Turner's claim to fame is that it is the furthest community in the continental United States from a major league baseball park. <laughs> <laughs> Safeco Field in Seattle, Washington is 646.93 miles away as the crow flies. That's about 825 road miles. That is a long home run drive just to watch the ball game, isn't it? First lines of the postcard read, have a safe ride on your tour of Montana's paved roads. Sounds like a good, long road trip. Mm -hmm. Perhaps some of you have come across this fence post roadside art. Corey Holmes is a railroad worker from Haver who creates and displays his works of art in several states and all across Montana. On my journey, they became a secondary goal to find and photograph as many of them as possible. Corey is well known as a sculptor and has been commissioned to create his works of art for private collectors and property owners far and wide. So as you travel, keep a sharp eye out. Did anybody notice my bike? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No one as the birthplace of Montana. Fort Benton was established in 1846 as a fur trading post on the banks of the Missouri River, seen here in the background. It gained prominence as the world's innermost port as the steamboats plied the Missouri River, bringing supplies and fortune seekers to Montana from St. Louis, 2,300 miles downriver. Now keep in mind, Fort Peck Dam did not exist. Shep's vigil strikes a chord in the hearts of many. 
August 1936, a sheep herder's body in a casket was loaded onto a baggage rail car headed east for burial, leaving behind his faithful dog, Shep. For the next five and a half years, Shep the Collie met every train at the station and became well known. People offered to adopt the dog, but the locals, they would not allow it, knowing that it was Shep's aim to simply keep his vigil. Shep slipped on the rail tracks and was hit and killed by a train, January 12th, 1942. He was laid to rest atop the bluff overlooking the depot. His funeral was attended by hundreds who mourned his passing. Easy to understand for those of you that know a dog's unconditional love. Let's check out the Carter Ferry in between Fort Benton and Great Falls one of three ferries that cross the Missouri River in Montana. I made it a goal to go across the Missouri River on a ferry and then come right back. So I pulled up, just the ferry operator there. He tells me that I need to be in, in an enclosed vehicle to go across, not on a motorcycle. <laughs> So I sat back and watched a couple of trucks pull on. Then out of nowhere, he waves me over, tells me to leave my bike behind, get on the ferry, and hide in the shack. <laughs> Later, as we crossed back, he allowed me to stand next to him as he pointed to a white truck parked on the bluff above the river and informs me that it is the U.S. Coast Guard. <laughs> they were watching over the ferry to make sure the operator was following policy. I got to go across and back and it was awesome. <laughs> There's no charge for the ferry crossings as they are funded by the state, the local ranchers and farmers to get their supplies to and from town. Let's stop into the Sip and Dip Lounge at the O'Hara Motor Inn in Great Falls. The Sip and Dip is a world famous tiki bar with live mermaids. It was also home base for Piano Pass, who had played there for 58 years before passing away in 2021. <clears throat> After a late Saturday night playing at the Sip and Dip, Pat would make an early morning drive up to the High Line to play the organ for Sunday morning services. <laughs> Here's a second postcard from Piano Pat. She says it all. I've lived in Montana all my life. Love it. Born and raised in Haver, in wheat country. So many beautiful people here. Have been very blessed with my music. Thanks for visiting my piano bar. I've been here for 55 years. God bless. Piano Pat. The Tiki Bar's back bar is a glass wall to the inn swimming pool with a mermaid's frolic. Tape a dollar bill to the glass wall and they will blow you a kiss. It's very unassuming from the outside. I never dreamed that there would be a legendary Tiki Bar with live mermaids in Montana. There it is. They're there. Here's a story of Kerry Nickel and his Indian Chief motorcycle. It was an early spring morning in Conrad when this crusty old farmer, unshaven, with a bulging pocket protector full of pens and papers, walks up to me and says, nice bike. He tells me he has a lot of bikes, including a 1946 Indian Chief with a factory sidecar. Well, for those of you that know motorcycles, you can imagine my ears perked up. I said, I bet that cost a pretty penny. 
He tells me he paid full price for it. $845, which is what the farmer he had bought it from had paid for it when he had bought it new. And no, this is not his Indian chief, but a photograph of one very much like it. I will explain. The next year, I was going back to find Kerry, see his Indian chief and swap some more stories. I Googled him to find his address and instead found his obituary. He had passed away August 12th, 2016, at the age of 63, just two months after I had met him. He is one of the kindest men that I have ever met. So I wrote, the last lines read, to, you, to his family and friends, I'm sorry for your loss. Carrie was very kind to me one spring morning. I would never forget him. Only wish I could have seen his Indian and thank you for showing it to me. From one Montana native to another, you shall be remembered, Perry, Ron Brother. Once thriving communities flourished along the High Line, due in large part to the Great Northern Railroad, many families came west by rail to prove up on their 160 acres, only to suffer through the dust bowls of the dirty 30s. Really tough times. Life has changed now for these small towns due to agricultural consolidation and equipment mechanization leading to fewer individuals required to perform the duties of ranching and farming. Consequently, many businesses have closed due to the high line decline. Postcard reads, the only businesses are a floral shop, fertilizer place, post office, and bar. We combined with two towns at a school 10 miles away. Montana Highway 2, which runs from east to west along the northern portion of Montana, is commonly referred to as the High Line. Dunkirk is just east of Shelby on the High Line. Its community is so small that it is not included in the census count. It is home to the Frontier Bar and Supper Club, which serves very delicious and hearty meals. Ranchers and farmers come in by the hundreds for miles around on Friday and Saturday nights. I kid you not, you had better have reservations. Just look at the size of that prime rib. I have enjoyed this cut of Montana beef, fresh baked bread, oven baked potato, and sweet corn dinner more than once. And for me, Jack Daniels makes it all the better. <laughs> now to the carousel rest area of Shelby. In Shelby, there's one of the best rest areas in the state, if not the world completely funded by a man named Harry Benjamin, pictured here, an old dryland grain farmer from Devon. The circus came to town and there was something wrong with the carousel, much to the children's disappointment. Harry drove all the way across the state to meet the circus at their next stop in Sydney on the eastern border of Montana. He offered to repair the carousel. They declined said it was not worth the trouble. So, Harry made an offer and bought it. <laughs> he called his son who drove out, and together they hauled it all the way back to Shelby. Harry rebuilt the carousel, bought land downtown, built a building to house it in. He had the inmates of the correctional facility to the south refinish and repaint all of the animals. <clears throat> Harry put it all together and donated it to the city of Shelby. One evening, after closing for the day, Harry gave me a private tour. And at the conclusion of the tour, he cranked the carousel music up very loud and danced a pretty good jig. <laughs> Harry passed away shortly after, at the age of 87 in 2020. 
Here's another look at the vintage 1936 carousel. If you ever go to Shelby, stop in and be a kid again. Go for a ride. And don't forget to have ice cream, okay? Okay. <laughs> I came upon this Montana road hazard as I crested a hill at 75 miles an hour north of Shoto on Route 89. I braked, pulled over, shut my bike down, and watched them peacefully graze along without a care in the world. Livestock is often turned out to free range in Montana. So as you travel, keep a sharp eye out. Have you ever seen a golden horse? Check out Mama and her baby on the right hand side. Beautiful. As we near the end of our ride, let's stop in to the East Glacier Lodge, built in 1913 by the Glacier Park Company, a subsidiary of the Great Northern Railroad. It was the first in a series of hotels built in and around Glacier National Park. If you ever find yourself passing by, stop in and check out the Grand Hall Lobby with its 40 foot tall Douglas fir columns. It's very impressive. Postcard reads, Glacier Park and Swan River End Road. Can you get any closer to heaven? Enjoy. Saving one of my favorite stories for last. For this story, we need to travel east, back on the High Line to Malta, highlighted by the red star on your map, I randomly met this man on horseback, a high plains drifter riding from Billings to East Glacier. White bearded guy on a horse with a mule following behind. He rode over to meet me alongside the road where we talked for a long time. I asked him where he spent the nights and he told me that sometimes ranchers and farmers would give him water for his animals and a place to rest, but that he also camped near creeks when needed. His bags were full of camping gear and provisions. Why was he doing it? For the same reason that I was, to experience Montana on our own terms, on horseback. We were just out for a ride. The days, they did not matter. What mattered was the ride, one mile at a time. I achieved my goal of riding all the paved roads in the state of Montana in 2019, and I felt a great sense of accomplishment. As I have aged, my ability to quickly react to the oncoming traffic crossing over the center line, for whatever reason, along with many other road hazards, helped me make the decision to sell my bike and end my riding days. Well, almost. <laughs> I bought a brand new Ford Mustang convertible, my new trusted steed. So though I do go for a ride these days, the wind is still in my face. And I started finding ways to tell these stories. Some of you may remember the 2017 Daily Interlake article. So the ride is not over. It's not over because history is never over. Just as the goal was once to try and capture the stories of Montana, now is to tell them to as many people as possible who are willing to listen. I have many more stories that I wish I could have fit into this presentation, but do you really want me to talk for hours? <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows, maybe I'll find a way one day to tell them all. Until then, just remember this. It's the journey, not the destination. One mile at a time. If you know of any others that would like to hear my stories, please direct them my way. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Thank you.